Thank you, sir. My name is Professor Mohammad Imran. I am working as uh, Head Department of Medicine, Services Institute of Medical Sciences. See, uh, we have different uh, sessions of uh, academic activity. In this section, we are going to do our clinical examination for the medical uh, students who are preparing for their uh, medical examination. This will consist of a series of uh, programs in which we will do different portions of the clinical examination. We will be going for general physical examination, the examination of the abdomen, the examination of the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, and the central nervous system. And in the end, we will be doing uh, examination of the uh, rheumatological system. So today we are going to do a general physical examination. But before we go for a physical examination, you should keep in mind few things. Number one, you should have a comfortable atmosphere when you are examining the patient. The temperature sh should be uh, reasonable. The patient should not be feeling very hot, hot or very cold. Similarly, uh, you must take the consent of the patient for the examination and you must explain to the patient that what you are going to do and how this examination is going to help us in the uh, evaluation of patient's condition and making a decision about what's the diagnosis. So today we start uh, with our general physical examination. Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Professor Muhammad Imran. I'm going to examine you uh, so that I can uh, decide about what is the condition you are having and what uh, we can uh, have. And uh, I'll try to be very gentle during the examination. If there is any pain or anything which you feel makes you uncomfortable, you can uh, just tell me what's going on. So now we start examining your hand. Can I see your hand? You see? So when you see the hand, what do you see? You see, in examination, always make uh, your examination very focused. So divide the examination into different portions. For example, if we see the hand, we look at the color of the hand. Now, what we can see on the color of the hand, the normal hand is generally pinkish in color. But if there is a difference in color, you should note that. For example, if it is very pale, or if it is uh, bluish in uh, discoloration, that may indicate either anemia or the presence of cyanosis. Similarly, you must see uh, the distribution of the color. If the distribution is normal, uh, it will be a uniformly pink palm. Otherwise, if you see only the thinner, the hypothenar eminences and the distal pharynges, uh, the volar surfaces of the tips of the finger, they are more pink or reddish as compared to the center of the palm. This patient is having a palmar erythema. So you note down the color of the patient. And then you note the general appearance of the hand. Look at the fingers. Are they complete? You should be having four finger and uh, one thumb. Look at the presence of veins. Are they distended or are they not distended? The veins are generally distended if the patient has conditions like uh, in which there is uh, increased cardiac output, for example, in heart failure in a patient who got uh, COPD when there is carbon dioxide retention and there is vasodilatation, patients who got uh, thyroid disease, that is hyperthyroidism. And if these veins are not collapsible, if you lift the hand and they do not collapse, that means possibly there is obstruction somewhere upstream in the venous system. So look for the presence of that, that obstruction. And then you come and look at the temperature of the patient's hand. Is it normal or it's high? or it is low. If the, pay, the hands are cold, it may be because of the ambient temperature. But the, if the ambient temperature is normal, these uh, coolness may be because the patient is having vasoconstriction in this area or the blood supply of the area is abnormal. Similarly, the, the hands are warm or hot in patients who've got uh, fever. Are the palms dry or they are moist? If they are dry, this could be because of hypothyroidism. And if they are moist, they can be seen in patients who are anxious, who've got hyperthyroidism, or those who've got uh, acromegaly. In acromegaly, the palms are not only greasy, they are quite big. And if you f have a doughy-like feeling when you shake hand with the patient. And when you shake hand with the patient, you also note down what is the type of grip patient has with you. So you can understand uh, about the muscle strength and the feeling of the patient uh, when he sh uh, shakes hand with you. And then you examine the outstretched ha hand for the presence of tremor. Uh, will you open your hands like this? And you can see the fine tremor. If you are unable to see the tremor on the hand, you can place a 
piece of paper and see these uh, vibrations they are magnified on that paper and you can see the paper shivering or you can have this flapping tremor examined by asking the patient to move the hand like this in extended uh, forearm and uh, you see the dorsiflexion of the hands and see if there are flapping tremors present and uh, when you have seen all this you can just now go to see for other examination for example you examine the presence of disease features on the nail when you examine the nail the nail generally are uh, very smooth and shiny and if they are rough or if their shape is concave generally generally their shape is slightly convex but if there is flat or con concave nail this is called coilonychia and if they are of white colored this is called leukonychia leukonychia indicates hypoproteinemia while coilonychia indicates the presence of iron deficiency anemia then one important thing which you see in the uh, nails is the presence of uh, clubbing now clubbing is uh, indicator of uh, many conditions there may be respiratory illnesses there may be uh, cardiac illnesses there may be uh, illnesses in the git there may be problem with the thyroid gland sometimes this clubbing may be uh, idiopathic or familial now how do we see clubbing clubbing is actually the loss of angle between the nail plate and the nail bed uh, the nail fold how we see it we see it using a cord if we place a cord like that we can see a small space between the cord and the nail so if this uh, space is obliterated and we can't see anything uh, through this uh, contact line this patient has clubbing the other way of seeing it is that you do you can put it down you can do it like this you can ask the patient to make the fingers go like this and there is a diamond shaped space between uh, these two nails so if the patient has preserved this uh, space this is uh, no clubbing but if this space is started disappearing this is uh, the patient is having clubbing and another way of uh, examining is that you elicit fluctuation it is the earliest phase of phase of clubbing that you put your fingers like that you can move a little bit like this and you press from one finger and feel if this pressure wave is transmitted to the other finger if this is transmitted this is called fluctuation and if this fluctuation is present at the base of the nail this patient is having initial clubbing so when you have examined this you look at the palmar creases are they normal or they not normal and then see if there is any other abnormality for example you may find pigmented spots these are called jane way lesions which may be seen in infective endocarditis you may see tender nodules in the pulps of the finger this may indicate oslo nodes which are present in infective endocarditis and similarly you can have many signs to name the you look at the uh, palms can they open normally if the fingers cannot open and they remain closed like that this means the patient has deputrans contracture which can be even palpated in this area and then uh, as i mentioned we see the general appearance of the hand and see if there are any joint abnormalities if there are any joint abnormalities note what joint distribution is there is it all joints are inflamed or only a group of joints is inflamed for example patient may have inflammation only of uh, the proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints are spared this is seen in rheumatoid arthritis but other type of arthritis patient may have involvement of both distal and proximal interphalangeal joint in addition to the metacarpophalangeal joints in osteoarthritis the joint of the thumb may only be involved so uh, in osteoarthritis you also note that there are bony nodes on the dorsal surface of the fingers these are called hibernian nodes and sometimes you've got uh, uh, diffuse distribution of these nodes the other nodes are called the bouchard nodes so the patient may have these hibernian nodes and the bouchard nodes present and when you have examined this you compare both hands are they symmetrical in appearance or not and then you examine the pulse of the patient you see for examination of the pulse you have to expose the radial artery may i open it yes, yes thank you so what you examine the pulse with the hand slightly pronated or semi pronated position and the wrist is slightly extended so that the radial artery is exposed and you take the rate note the rhythm and you look at some of the characters 
And uh, these things we will examine in detail when we see the cardiovascular system. So right now we just take uh, the rate of the pulse, note down what is the rhythm, is it regular or is it irregular. And then we take the patient's blood pressure, we'll be taking the blood pressure at the end of the uh, examination. And now when we leave the hand, from the hand we move to the facial area. So we have to see the neck, can I open it? Yes, sir. Thank you. So we see from the neck above. Now first thing we see is on inspection the color of the face. Is it pale? The pale color is seen in anemia. Do we see any jaundice? It is yellowish in color. Jaundice is particularly seen in the eyes. We'll see what else we see in the eye. And then we see the hair. Now we see the scalp hair, the eyebrows, the hair on the upper lip and the facial hair. Now, in uh, the hair, we note what's the color of the hair, what is the distribution of hair loss, if there is any. You see, in male, we tend to have the M type of pattern, which is called uh, male type of baldness. There is frontal recession. And the female, we've got W type of uh, hair loss. And this is a diffuse sort of hair loss, or if there is any patchy hair loss, that is called alopecia areata. That means there are areas in the skull where there is hair loss and uh, the other parts of the skull show a normal hair distribution. And you see the texture of the hair. Normal hair is uh, fine uh, silky. If the hair is coarse and dry, this may indicate hypothyroidism. Similarly, if there is lo loss of eyebrows, particularly on the sides, this happens in uh, hypothyroidism. The features on the hypothyroid face are that they look uh, puffy and the appearance is that of a coarse skin while in acromegaly we see there are uh, there is puffiness but we see the lips are big the nose is big the 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 tongue is big and the patient has sweating and greasy in appearance while in uh, uh, hypothyroid the skin is generally dry because in acromegaly there is increased working of the sebaceous gland so the patient has more sweating and then uh, we see the hair on the upper lip and the uh, beard area, but particularly in the females, if they have this, this may indicate androgenization. And then when uh, we go from the general appearance of the face, we look at the eyes. Now what we want to look at the eyes, is there any ptosis present? That is the palpebral fissures, they are open normally. And then you examine the sclera of the patient. Can you see on this side? Yes, so you can see sclera on this side, yes. So you can see the sclera. Sclera, in sclera we generally see the jaundice. The jaundice can be seen much better in the uh, sunlight. In this light, the lighter shades of jaundice may not be appreciated. If it is deep jaundice, that can be seen in this light. But if you want to be sure if, that there is no jaundice, this, uh, this uh, sign should be elicited under sunlight. And then you can ask the patient to look upward and just gently roll the lower eyelid downwards and you can see the conjunctival uh, mucous membrane. Here we see the presence of uh, anemia. Is there any pallor present there? Because anemia is better seen in the mucous membranes than in the skin. When you are examining the sclera, at the same time also note the cornea of the patient. There are uh, findings on the cornea in patients who've got dyslipidemia, that is called arcus. Look for the presence of arcus. Although there may be in some patients a well-developed uh, caser flesher ring, but generally it's difficult to see a caser flesher ring on a naked eye examination. It is usually done on a slit lamp examination. And then you should also see the presence of cataract. If there is a cataract present inside the pupil in a younger patient, that may indicate the presence of diabetes. So look for uh, these signs, that is the jaundice, the pallor, the arcus, and the uh, cataract inside the eye. Then we examine the nose. I'm going to examine your nose. So examine both nostrils. For the presence of uh, any polyps, any discharge, any uh, erythema there, and must see uh, both nostrils are uh, symmetrical. Then we examine the uh, oral cavity of the patient. 
we just look at the lips and the angles of the mouth. The lips or angle of the mouth, if they are inflamed, that may be showing about certain conditions. For example, this is called chelitis and angular stomatitis. If there is uh, uh, ulceration at the angles of the mouth, which is usually seen in fungal infections, and the chelitis may be seen in uh, the deficiencies of uh, vitamin B complex. Can you open your mouth? So we examine generally for the presence of teeth, they are normal or they are uh, are dentures and the number, we count the number, number, is there any deficiency of the teeth? Then we ask the patient to please stick out your tongue. Okay, take it inside. Okay, fine. You examine the inside of the cheek, the color of the tongue, and then you examine the palate as well. Now what we want to see in the examination of the oral cavity, as I mentioned, we want to see the uh, general orodental hygiene, we want to see the presence of any ulcers if they are present, if there is any discoloration present. So discoloration may be because of cyanosis, the tongue, these, particularly the ventral surface of the tongue will appear bluish in color. We want to see the presence of pallor, if there is anemia the tongue will be pale. And if the tongue is inflamed in conditions like uh, candidiasis, that is erythrogenic candidiasis or in uh, uh, iron deficiency or other deficiencies of uh, micronutrients, the tongue may be inflamed. This is called glossitis. And uh, you look for the presence of uh, ulceration in the tongue, particularly in the dorsal surface, on the sides. We look for the presence of ulcers in the cheeks, on the hard palate. And then we also look for the presence of white areas, which is called leukoplakia. The diffuse leukoplakia, which is uh, because of the candidiasis, can be easily differentiated from the uh, mucosal uh, uh, whitening of the tongue which is present usually on the sides. This leukoplakia is uh, an indicator of serious underlying conditions, particularly uh, severe immunocompromised condi immunocompromising conditions. Look at the tonsils, uh, are they hypertrophied or they are inflamed or not. So this is what we examine inside the oral cavity. And after the oral cavity, we come to the examination of the neck of the patient. So in the neck we see the pulsations. So the pulsation part will be doing in the examination when we are examining the cardiovascular system. Right now we are interested in the presence of uh, goiter in the neck. Look for the presence of thyroid in the neck. If thyroid is palpable, visible or not. If it is palpable, note down what sort of uh, abnormality is present in the thyroid gland. So to examine the thyroid gland, we have to uh, make the patient sit. Can you sit down? Thank you very much. So we examined it from the back like this and the, uh, we asked the patient to swallow. Just swallow your saliva. Yes, again. So, so we can feel if there's any swelling, if it moves with deglutition or if it doesn't move with deglutition. Thyroid usually moves with deglutition. So you note down whether it's a diffuse enlargement of the thyroid or there is a focal enlargement and are there any tender areas or you can feel a thrill on the thyroid gland and after you have noted down the thyroid gland you also look for the presence of lymph nodes chin down please you the presence of various group of lymph nodes in the neck so you examine the submandibular lymph node the supraclavicular lymph node and the lymph nodes in the posterior fossa, fossa and once you have made the patient sit at the same time you examine for the presence of secular edema as well. Keep in mind that the examination should be smooth and comfortable so you should not make your patients uh, change position again and again. So if you have made the patients uh, sit examine the areas which you want to examine when the patient is sitting. So just put a pressure on the sacral area and see if there is any uh, sacral edema, which can be seen in uh, patients who are bedridden and have heart failure or conditions which cause fluid overload. And then you can examine the lymph nodes in the sitting position, but you can also examine the lymph nodes in the supine position as well. So can you lay down? So I prefer examining the lymph node when the patient is lying. So it's easier to examine the lymph nodes. Now we uh, examine the lymph nodes of the patient. Can you take your arm up? So lift the arm above, place your fingers high, as high in the axilla as possible and then bring the arm down and then you can feel the lymph nodes, the medial groups 
and the lateral groups. Similarly, you can do it on this. Bring it down. So you can examine various uh, lymph node groups and then you can examine the lymph nodes on the groin and particularly when you are examining the lymph nodes on the groin, you must tell the patient that what are you going to do. I am going to examine your uh, lymph nodes in this area. So you see, exposure is the most important thing. When you want to examine an area, you must expose. But uh, sometimes uh, the socio-cultural uh, background of the patient does not allow uh, proper examination. In that case, we have to examine in a compromised situation, so that doesn't matter. So whenever you are examining the patients, uh, you must not uh, put the patient in a situation where the patient feels embarrassed or compromised and uh, if uh, we go and the patient has this sort of uh, feeling the examination would be compromised and we will not be getting the information we required. So just keep in mind the patient's social, cultural, sexual orientations and the restrictions the patients have because of uh, this reason. So examination can be uh, tailored according to all those uh, situations. Now we examine the feet of the patient. Generally in the feet of the patient on general physical examination we look for the presence of uh, dependent edema. We look it against a bony prominence that is the medial malleolus. Uh, in most of the patients we are looking for edema, the edema may not be visible. In some patients it's generally visible and we don't need uh, really any uh, uh, sort of timing for that. But to, if it's not visible, we should place it with a firm pressure for at least uh, 30 seconds before we say for sure that there is no edema. And then we look for the presence of uh, distended veins or there are any scars. For example, patients who got a cabbage, they have a scar of removal of uh, the saphenous vein from here. So look for the presence of distended veins, edema, if there is any discoloration for example. Cellulitis may be present in patients and particularly if the cellulitis is present, one must examine the interdigital space because there may be fungal infection here which may be a source of uh, the cellulitis. And look at the sole of the patient's feet, is, can you turn it around a little like this? So look at the sole of the patient, is it normal or is not normal? So generally this is what we do on the examination of the feet. Now the examination of the blood pressure during general physical examination, uh, it is one of the very important steps and it has a lot of catches. You see the position of the patient, the position of the uh, BP apparatus, the, the application of the cuff and how do you do it, uh, do it with a uh, palpatory method and then do it with an auscultatory method. Why do we want to do with an uh, auscultatory method and uh, before that we want to do with a palpatory method because in some patients who got very high blood pressure, during their uh, uh, measurement of their blood pressure when the Krotokov sounds they appear, sometimes before disappearing they disappear for some time and then they reappear and then they disappear. So this gap is called auscultatory gap and if we start doing uh, the examination of the blood pressure in this auscultatory gap, the upper portion of the systolic pressure is missed. So that may be representing a, uh, not a very true picture of the patient's blood pressure. So we first go with a palpatory method and then we go with an auscultatory method. So what we do is the heart, the blood pressure apparatus and the cuff should be at the same level. The cuff should be covering at least 3 fourth or 75 percent of the arm circumference. And the tubings should be slightly on side because these tubings when they move if they touch the stethoscope, they produce uh, uh, the sounds which are similar to Krotokov sound and that may cause uh, confusion. Sometimes we can keep these tubings on the upper side instead of the lower side if you are having problems. So what we do, we first go for examination with a palpatory method. Locate the radial pulse, start inflating. Feel the radial pulse when it disappears, note it and 
then start deflating and see when the radial pulse reappears. So an average of these two readings is called uh, systolic pressure by the palpatory method. We cannot have uh, diastolic pressure by the palpatory method. And when we start auscultating, we inflate uh, the uh, bladder pressure above uh, the systolic pressure by measure by palpatory method, approximately 20 millimeters is enough. So we lift the blood pressure 20, meter, 20 millimeters above. Preferably this, you see, this shirt should not be between the stethoscope and the skin because this is uh, possibly going to give you artifact if this moves. So we just try to keep the stethoscope on the skin. Now the Krodokov sounds, they start appearing at 110 millimeter and they disappeared at 80 millimeter for this patient. So this patient's uh, blood pressure in the right upper limb in supine position is 110 over 80 millimeters of mercury. And the blood pressure should be taken in both arms. And a, the blood pressure which is higher, either of the left arm or the right arm, is the representative blood pressure of the patients. And normally there's a slight difference between these two pressures. The, Difference may be 5 to 10 millimeters. If it is more than that, this is uh, pathological and one should look for the reasons for this uh, discrepancy in blood pressure. And in subsequent examination, the patient's blood pressure which is uh, higher either on the left limb or the right limb is taken as the representative blood pressure. So this is about uh, general physical examination and uh, we conclude this session here. Thank you very much for your cooperation and next time we'll be doing another portion of the clinical examination.